shiur will be dedicated to the memory of Rivka Bat Bahia Shumer Shmuel Shmuel Ben Hefzi Zilpa Bracha Bat Sivya and Zeev Ben Avraham. Also, we will dedicate whatever we have to say tonight as a refuah shlema, as a good rehabilitation and good help for Lior Chaim Ben Dorit. Oh, only Lior, and the rest is refuah shlema. We will include Lior Chaim Ben Dorit Ben Ele among those for whom we said Leilu Nishmat in memory. And now these names, we pray for them that they should have Rifu Ashlema, and this lecture will be also dedicated to them. David Ben Shmuel, Yona Ben Sara, Osnat Ben Mashiach, Chaya Bracha Bachura, Ruhama, Aliza, Sara Hanna, Bat Esther, Liba. Some names. Ruhama Chava Beila Bat Chaya, Rezel Rivka Bat Basha, Noah Israel Ben Ayala Hinda, Arik Ariel Chaim Ben Vera, Zahava Bat Zulai, Rivka Bat Rachel, Eliyahu Elush, Ailush Ben Tova, Mishael Chai Ben Zilpa, Haim Yechezkel Ben Lea, Yitzchak Yitzchak Rafael, Ben Rachel, Eliyahu Pinchas Ben Bat Sheva. Here at Son, we pray for them that they should be in good health. Amen. Bishkut at Torah. I know that you have consented to study with me the Ten Commandments. Now, we just read the Ten Commandments. It's important to learn the Ten Commandments. I mean, it's a minimum. You ask Jews, do you know the Ten Commandments? His first instinct is, oh, of course, and then he realizes that he doesn't know them. The truth is that even if you know, the, if you know them by heart, it's not easy to understand their depth and their meaning. We're talking here about the Ten Commandments. Everybody knows that the Torah is not only the Ten Commandments, right? The Torah consists of how many mitzvot? Do you know? 613 mitzvot. Ten commandments is only ten mitzvot. So why is it that we give them such importance? In some communities, when we read them, everybody stands. Not all, some. So why is it that they are so important? It's because they are considered to be foundations. They are not just a mitzvah. They are Foundations, as we will explain progressively soon. Everybody knows the word Torah. But do you know the numerical value of Torah? The word Torah has a number. Does anybody know how much is Torah is Taf, Vav, Resh, and He. Very good. But you're the daughter of a rabbi, so it was not fair. So you see, the word Torah, Taf is 400. Taf, 400. Vav of Torah is 6, 406. Resh is 200. That is 606. And He is 5, that's 611. And the Talmud in Masechet Makot, the last page of Masechet Makot, tells us that you see, the number of mitzvot that we do is in accordance with the numerical value of the word Torah. But are they supposed to be 613? You're talking about 613. So what happened? How come Torah is only 611? What's your answer? No. 
the answer is the Gemara, the Talmud tells us the first two commandments were not given through Moshe. Moshe gave us all the commandments. But the first two were given by the divine presence them, he, itself. I mean God himself. The voice of God broke out in the first two commandments. If you remember the portion of the Torah that we read last week, here is what happened. The Jewish people were standing at the mountain of Sinai. After three days of preparations, of purity, and sanctifying themselves. And then, when God appeared, God was going to say all the commandments. I mean, this, the, the Ten Commandments. But the first two commandments only, we had the privilege to hear. After they heard the second commandment, two commandments, they immediately turned to Moshe and they said to him, Please, Moshe, daber ata imanu venishma'a, ve'al yedaber imanu elokim pen namut. Please, you speak to us. Let, tell him not to speak to us. Because if he keeps speaking to us, we are going to die. Which means they felt, as soon as they heard the voice of God, in fact, according to the Midrash, many dropped dead. Because not everybody can hear the voice of God. You know, it says in the Torah, let's talk about the face of God. You know that your face, your face, my face, is the face of God. Your faces. And yet, it says in the Torah, Ki lo yirani ha'adam vachai. No one can see me and still live. It means, what does it mean? It means that while we are still here in this world, we cannot see his face. In order to see his face, we have to be in the other world. And you know what happens according to our sages and the works of Kabbalah? You know when the time comes when we die, that minute, when we stop breathing, what happened? Before I tell you what happened, I will tell you what goes on. And the big question that, that surrounds us all our life. I'm sure many of you know the blessing that we say after we come out from the bathroom. Asher yatsar et adam baravo nekavim nekavim chalulim chalulim. We speak about the wisdom of the creation of God who has created our bodies in such a way the body is full of holes. Our bodies are hallowed. It's porous. You don't believe me? Take a microscope and check any part of your body. And you will find out that your body is full of holes. It's porous. And okay, that's one fact. There is another fact. There are two forces in us. Two forces. One force that comes from the body and one force that comes from the soul. And we are in conflict. All throughout our life, we are in great conflict. It's a great war that goes on. The neshama which is the real you and me, make no mistake about it, the body is only a hotel. The body is only a storage, a storage room. When the body dies and it, when, when we bury the body, it's not the person that died. We cannot die. Only we are, the neshama itself, I mean the you and me, that one who, who died, whose body, let's put it this way, that one whose body died, He's looking at his own body being buried. Do you know that? Of course, you can tell me, you can say whatever you want, Rabbi, we believe you. Which means, well, it's up to the believer. 
But the truth is that if one with a little bit of perception, a little bit of personal thinking, will come to this conclusion. We have two forces in us, tremendous forces. The force of physicality and the force of spirituality. The force of spirituality wants us upper world. I will explain. The force of physicality wants us downward. And those forces are in conflict all the time throughout all our life. Any human being has good feelings and bad feelings, which means he has good inclination and bad inclination. Everybody wants to do good, no question about it. Everybody feels good when you give charity or when you help a sick person or when, when you cause someone else to feel better. You have good feelings. Everybody knows that. Even a goy, even everybody has noble feelings in himself. Only most of the time, unfortunately, the other side of the heart, which is dominated by that evil, the negative side, the Yetzer Hara, has the upper hand. Unfortunately, why? Because, I'll tell you, it seems that the Neshama is the stronger, because it, 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 it is invincible. But at the same time, it is the body who has the upper hand, because that's the body that we see. The body is the one that we see, so therefore physicality is more tangible. You understand what I'm saying? Physicality wins more. We, pre, we, we, we are inclined to go after that which gives pleasure to our body. That's the truth. You have to be on a higher level of spirituality to challenge the feeling, the attraction towards physicality. Don't we all know that? Everybody wants pleasures. Everybody wants even things that are forbidden we desire. <clears throat> That's the urge of the body. The body wants things with which he enjoys. The body enjoys good food, for example. Now, our sages say in Masechet Gitin on page 76, when you see that, there is, that they give you food that you love, stay away from it. I, I, I will quote it in Hebrew, as it says in the Gemara. What kind of food that is, in fact, this is what you love most, stay away from it. Why is that? Because now you are going to be, because you love that kind of food, and of course it's only an example, it means anything that you love in this life, be careful not to take too much. Because if you go, all the, even though it is kosher, you're talking about kosher food. Let's say you go to a wedding party. You know, they give you cocktail. I always, my God, how much people can eat. I, I, I never eat in cocktails. And yet I get corpulent. They don't. And they eat. And I can't believe it how much they eat. And the food is succulent, delicious, everything. Why is it? So what's wrong with that? It's glad kosher. And yet our sages say, be careful, stay away from that. They don't say it's forbidden. They just advise us. You want to take care of good. You want to. You want to be in control of yourself. Don't lose yourself into something that is kosher, and but you take it in profusion, in abundance. Stay away from that. Why? Because you are going to weaken that side of spirituality. Your physicality is going to get stronger, and you will have no more control over the needs of your spirituality. And there is need, there are plenty of needs for your spirituality to do, to, to pray, to do tzedakah, to learn Torah. Why are you here? I'm asking you, dear ladies, you're here to learn Torah, right? Why? What made you come? That good side of yours, that inclination which comes from the soul, does not come from the body. The body tells you go and watch a bowling game. 
in television. The body tells you, go and instead go and have a nice meal in a restaurant. The body tells you other things. But that side of you that told you, come and listen to the Vrei Torah, is that side comes from the Neshama. Now, those, this is a force that we have in us. Good and bad. Right? Like it says, God created in us good and bad. The only thing is which one is going to win. So therefore you have to, to trick the side that is weaker. If you give it strength, you are going to lose when you are faced with the needs of the other side. If the other side wants you to go upward, spiritual, then you have to give it energy. But if you give your physicality too much energy, even in things that are kosher and that are allowed, only you are too much immersed on the, in them, you are going to weaken that side of, uh, of force that you have in spiritual means, and then you are going to start committing sins. Automatically you are going to start, if you enjoy so much food, and you eat, you eat, you eat with kosher, one day, if you, if you go into the habit of doing this, what happens? One day you are going to allow yourself to eat non-kosher. How does it start? Let's say you go into a restaurant. Maximum you will say, ah, is it kosher? They say, yeah, of course we will show we're kosher. And you are not going to bother asking if there is a license. You are going to check the, the, the date. You are not going to check anything. You just go and eat. Why? Because you are moved by the physicality that has the upper hand to which you gave so much energy before, and now you are in trouble. You don't have much koach. You don't have much energy to dominate that side of uh, physicality. The physicality wins. And that's an example for all the other things that people like to do in this world. And Hashem puts us together. The neshama and the body. The body is not you. The body is only a cover. It's only a storage. The real you is the neshama. Now the neshama, where does it come from? From upper, right? It comes from heaven. We all came from heaven. We all were once in heaven. We were sent to this world to earn our place in heaven. So what happens? The neshama that comes from the upper world has always the tendency to go only upward. She wants only the things that bring us upward. But the physical body, since it, is, it, it was created from where? From the earth, right? We were created, I mean the body itself was made from the earth. That's the physicality. Anything that is physical that you can touch, anything that is tangible has been created from the earth. Therefore, the body wants only things that brings it to the earth. Let me give you an example that is fi uh, in physics. I don't know how they call it in English, la pesanteur, I mean, the, the, the. When you throw a stone upward, where does it go? Oh. It comes back to the ground. Why? Gravity. Why is it that it doesn't continue its, its flight? Why? The force of gravity, thank you very much. I had it on the tip of my tongue, but somehow it disappeared. It happens to me. But the, because of the force of gravity, but what is the force of gravity? The force of gravity means that if it is physical, it has to come down to its nat natural source. That's all. But try to fill up a balloon with air. You will see that it will fly upward. Why? Because air is an extraction of the neshama of that which is spiritual. So you see it has the tendency to go upward. But anything that is physical will go down. So you see now when you follow the urges of your body, then automatically it brings you down. Then you will not have much power to win the battle for your neshama. That's what happens when people are not religious, <laughs> secularism, people who, want, who, do, who do not want to abstain from anything who hardly come on Yom Kippur. And they come to, on Yom Kippur, they come to pray, and then you see them like dead. They don't even have the energy to withstand one day a year. A religious, a religious, a religious man, definitely he fasts uh, six times a year. And when he fasts, uh, he could take another day, and it's not a big problem. But I have seen so many times people who are very 
irreligious, but they still remember the day of Yom Kippur they come, and that day they are like dead. If you push them just like this, they fall. Why? They don't have enough power to withstand the force of spirituality that they had, because they gave too much to their physicality, and automatically not much force has, has remained. Now, let's say that this was an introduction to the talk of tonight. So Hashem gave us a Torah. And that Torah has 613 mitzvot. And in the word Torah, we can see the numerical value of 611. What happened to the other two? Since it was given directly from God, so therefore, they don't count in the 613. They are the first dominant commandments. Those are the commandments that we are going to talk about now. And the rest was given through Moshe. Why is that? Because the people of Israel begged Moshe, please, as soon as we heard the voice of God, we can't withstand the voice of God. We are going to die. What happened? Why is it when you hear the voice of God, you drop dead? Because you are not prepared. We are not prepared for it. We are physical, much more than spiritual. In order to hear the voice of God, you have to be up there. In order to see the face of God, you have to be up there. And I was going to tell you that you know what happens at that time when we die? How is it that, why is it that the neshama, the soul, we say, how do we die? The neshama, the soul, departed the body, Right? And if the soul is not in accord, is in, is in constant disaccord with the body, then why it doesn't choose to live? We already told you that the body is full of holes, right? Holes, no problem. Any air, give it holes, it goes away. Try the balloon. Take a balloon. I mean, uh, blow into it. But if there is a hole there, the whole air is going to come out. If you say that the body is full of holes, then let the neshama, let, why do you stay with the body that you don't like? You don't like the body because it does exactly the opposite of what you want. Especially when you, when you exaggerate and you give your body things that are not kosher and things that are not, that are not uh, 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 mutar and everything, the neshama is in tremendous anxiety. So, it's all open, get out. It could come out from the nose, it could come out from the eyes, it could come out from anywhere. And it could come out even from the skin. It cannot. You want to know why? Because she has an order, a command. You don't move from the body, God says to the neshama, until I appear to you. When you will see my face, that's the time to get out. So I just shared with you a big secret. You know what happened when the guy dies? At that minute, you know when she left, the neshama? When God says, hey, come up. When she sees the face of God. Of course, it's difficult to prove it to you. People will not believe that, perhaps. We have ground sound for all this. Only we cannot just explore that in a few minutes. But you should know. That when she sees the face of God, like a magnet, she goes after it. And that's how we die. And why is it that she doesn't see him before? Because if she sees him before, we will die prematurely. Because it's impossible to see the face of God unless if we go to the other world. So that's one point that we wanted to discuss tonight before we start with the first commandment. Yes, Dan. The face of Hashem because it's not physical, so do we know? All right, a very good question. I almost expected this question, but I didn't believe that it would come. <laughs> How do we know that she sees the face of God? What is it that she sees? Do we give a corporal figure to Hashem, to God? But you have to understand, why is it that, we, that she cannot see him before? Because she is still in a body. But if she is already allowed to see him, that means she can see that energy that is the face of God. We cannot see it, we are still covered by a body. So now you put me in trouble. How to explain that, which is not easy to explain. But you have to understand, in other words, 
We understand. The neshama, when it goes out, it is already something else. When it, is, when it sees the face of God, it's because Hashem allows her. What's going to be now? She's going to die. She cannot die. She is an extraction of God himself. All she can do is immediately get out. If she stays further, she will die. Because she has seen the face of God. But since the face of God is for the purpose to make her come out, to attract her. So as I said before, as the, the work of Kabbalah says, the, in the Kabbalah it says that she goes after the face of God like a magnet. See, a magnet taken, but that's why God created many things in this world for us to discuss and to understand why is it that there is magnet? And why is it that the function of the magnet is to draw something that is of the same substance? It draws it. It's to give us an insight into what happens in some examples such as this one. The neshama is part of God. It comes from Him. Since God occupies all the space of the worlds altogether, so we come from Him. At that time when, it wants, when He wants you back, you go like a magnet. But as long as she doesn't see of God, she doesn't have the permission to live. That's the reason why she stays, despite her tremendous anxiety, staying especially with the Rasha, with a bad man. And there's no more excruciating pain like the pain of the Neshama when she exists in a body which does not obey the laws, the, the, the laws of God. You have not, do you remember the story of Yaakov and Esav being in the body, in the womb of, the, of their mother, Rivka? Mm-hmm. It says in the Torah, Rivka was going crazy. She didn't know that she had twins. But there was a whole battle going on in her womb. Yaakov and Esav. Yaakov represents good. Esav represents evil. You have the force of evil with the force of good living together in the same space. For Yaakov, it is excruciating. For Esav, it's a bothering. Why don't bother me? And, and Yaakov, and they were fighting. And Rivka, spiritually talking, because of her level in Ruach HaKodesh, she was able to understand that there is going, that there is a commotion that she cannot explain. Therefore, Hashem. she went to the Navi, to the Prophet, to tell him what's going on. What is happening in, one, in my womb? I'm going crazy. And then he explained to her that you have two nations inside you. Two nations that are in fact the opposite in nature. Two. One evil, one that is good. Of course you could always ask me why is it that Rivka uh, deserved to have one evil side in her? Remember that she came also from an evil side but the main thing is the main reason is because Rivka is like one of the matriarchs and the patriarchs who had a destiny to build up the nation of Israel. If you build up the nation of Israel, then you have to cope with evil and good, both of them together. Yes? If it's the um, face of God that practically the Nisham leave, then what's the point of the Malach Mavet? Which, explain yourself. If you were saying that the only thing that keeps the neshama and the person alive is that he hasn't se- the neshama hasn't seen the face of God. If she sees the face of God, then why do we need the angel of death? Very good question. Now let me ask you a question before I give you the answer. Do you know what is the meaning of the angel of death? Do we know? I'll tell you the truth. Life and death is not in the hands of the angel of death. The angel of death, our sages said, that it is, is, is only a malach, is an angel. He is a servant of God, willing to do the bid of his master, and waiting for the master to say the okay. When God presents his face to the neshama, then malach Mavet is ready to take the body. That's the meaning of Malach Amal. Of course, our sages said that the angel of death, he has a sword, and that sword has one liquid, and that liquid falls into a drop that falls of poison, that falls into the throat of the... All this is spiritual, of course, has nothing to do with physicality, and then he, that's how he dies. 
and the guy dies. But the truth is that it has nothing to do with the fact that the Neshama is out because she saw the, the, the face of God. It's only the permission that is given to both, the Neshama to come out from the body and the angel of that to do his work. Which means there is also another action that not only to take the life, but to take care of that life. Which means to make sure that the body is dead. There's much more to say about this, by the way, and, there's, and I would like to go into it because I did speak about it some time before, but then it would take us away from the lecture. I would just want you to know that there is absolutely no contradiction. Malach Mavet is there to serve what he has to serve, but still we all need the permission of the Master to say, okay. And our sages, poetically, they put the picture for us in such a way that she looks at him and that's how she goes back to him. Good question. I mean, what do you do then with the, with the angel of death? The answer is, that's what it means, the angel of death. Do we know what is angels? What is angels? One day we will talk about angels. <laughs> There's plenty to say about this. Rabbi, one, one last point, one last point. And what was the point when David Amela was learning the whole time that the Malach mother had to distract him in order to take his life? If God wants him dead to begin with, even during the Torah learning, he should have just showed his face. Absolutely. But you have to understand that all this is made by our sages in a poetical way. Even the illustrations. They illustrate things in the form of stories such as this one. Malachi Mavet came to the Garden of David, when David, as long as he kept saying the Psalms, Malach Mavet, the angel of death, didn't have any power over him, so he was waiting for him. He could not uh, uh, take, I mean, he could not uh, seize the neshama of, uh, of, uh, of David, let's put it this way, as long as he was reciting his psalm. So what happened? So the, uh, the, the, uh, God made him stumble over a step, and at that minute, there was a fraction of a second that he stopped saying the psalms, and that minute, uh, God probably showed his face at that minute because all this has to go together you have to understand normally we, there's not much to ask about this but if you still ask so we tell you it's all poetical it's all poetical what is Malach Mavit doing is there any tangibility to Malach Mavit of course not now, what is the point the point is that to teach us that David Amelech as long as he had the power of Torah within him there is no power to Malach Mavet. And why is that? Very simple. What did I say before? The Neshama, the, the soul, she wants to go out before you want. But she stays there. But if the body learns Torah, she wants to stay. You understand the point? If King David kept reciting the Psalms, there is no place where the Neshama wants to be more than that place. So therefore he had to die. So the Malach Mavet, the angel of death came and made him stumble. At that minute, because Hashem gave permission. Which means the Neshama show, saw, saw the face of Hashem. She wants to go, but she is retained. Why? The sounds of David. That's why they made him stop. Stop for a second. At that minute, the Neshama goes out. Finished. Now, those are not things that we can explore easily. You know that all this is the depth of the stories and the Midrashim of our sages that have to be studied with much more um, depth and carefulness. And now, so we understand now why the first two commandments were said by God himself and the rest, all the other commandments had to be said but by Moses. Why? The Jewish people was not in the proper level to hear the voice of God. Therefore, they said, stop, 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 stop. You, Moshe, continue. Not God, please. Why is that? We were not on the level. And therefore, there is a certain thing that happens in nature. When you are not on the, on the level, then nature overcomes you. I am sure that there were many others who were able to hear the voice of God according to their great level. But remember, the Jewish people left Egypt with 2 million and 6 and 400,000 strangers. People who worshipped Abu Dazara, the Erev Rav, you know, the mixed uh, from, uh, from other countries. They became Jews, of course, at the mountain of Sinai. But they were not on the level. They are still not on the level even today. But that's a different uh, some, uh, something else to discuss some other time. 
And now let's start. The first commandment was, Anochi Hashem Elokech. Before I explain, let me tell you another point. The Midrash tells us, brought also in the Talmud, that when they heard the voice of God, as I said, Yatsa Nishmatam, their soul came out. You just said it. And the question that you should have asked me, my friend, is why did Hashem do it this way? If God wanted, he could, he could have done the necessary to avoid that, right? All he has to do is to decide, no, you stay healthy, even if you hear my voice. Why did he bother talk if he knows, and he knows everything, that they are going to die when they hear his voice? You understand the question? Are you sure you understood the question? Why does he bother? I mean, if he wants them dead, he can kill them. If he wants them alive, to, be, to be alive, he doesn't start like this, right? Knowing that they are going to fall and die, why did he start with telling them the first two commandments? Or else, let him, hear, let, let him make his voice heard without uh, causing uh, such a massive uh, destruction. Yes, let's see. I almost said it, but that's not the answer. The answer is to give us a message that one has to give practically his life to keep every mitzvah of the Torah. Even if it requires your life. Of course, per exactly to the point, there are only three things that require us to give our life for the sake of the Torah. And that is the three fundamental principles for which Yehareg Ali Avor. One, is supposed to give his life rather than to commit them. And that is, the, number one is Avodah Zara, to worship idol, other the gods, if they coerce you. There were many times throughout the generations that Jews were put to some terrible trial, that they were forced to take up another religion. It happened in many, many times. It happens during the time of Rome. Rome wanted them to change their religion. It happened in the time of the Greeks. They wanted also to, do, to they wanted the Jews to obliterate their religion. It happened even 500 years ago. In Spain, what is it that the Christians wanted? Through the Inquisition, the Inquisitors were the most cruel priests you have ever known. And they burned people alive. Why? They told them, I will give you the choice. You become a Christian.